Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Una Daly from the Open Courseware Consortium, and um, I want to introduce Andy Lane uh, from Open University, who is going to be the moderator for our webinar today on considering OER and accessibility for diverse learners. Are you there, Andy? Yes, thanks, Una. Um, welcome, everybody, as well. From this side of the Atlantic, it looks like we've got a very cross-Atlantic uh, uh, membership or participants. Um, as Una says, I'm going to be the, the moderator for uh, this webinar. I'm going to just do the, the early introductions, and then we'll have the presentations from Una, uh, Chet, and Matilde. Uh, and then hopefully at the end we'll have some time for some discussion. And do please put any questions you might have into the uh, the chat as we go along, and I'll try to follow them and pick them up. In terms of how things work in Collaborate, you've probably already seen that, that we've got both audio and video possibilities here, but we're only using the audio. You've got the big long list of participants, 24 of us now. There might be some more turning up late, but uh, many there. And you've got the chat box uh, down to the bottom left uh, in terms of doing that. So if you've got anything you want to, to say as we're going along, just put some comments on there and we'll keep uh, following those. And as Una has already said, do introduce yourself um, as we go along or right now. Now, in terms of what we're going to be doing, we say, short introductions, and then we've got the, the three presentations on overall accessibility needs and goals from UNA, OER and accessibility considerations for OER, uh, and other things that, uh, from the experience of the Open University, and also then the case study of dyslexia and modern language learning staff development. Uh, we've got a whole set of resource links at the end you'll be able to follow and look at, and then we'll have uh, the discussion. So just to introduce ourselves, I should introduce myself more formally. Uh, I'm Professor of Environmental Systems here at the Open University, but I've been involved in open education resources since 2005. I was the founding director of the uh, Open Learn platform here from the Open University. And I've also been on the uh, board of the Open Courseware Consortium uh, for two years. And I've been to any number of uh, national and international meetings and involved in all sorts of projects all around the world around open education resources. Uh, but it's good to see so many other people with those interests. Uh, and now I'll just ask Una, then Chet and Matilde to introduce themselves uh, uh, as well before we get into their presentation. So Una, would you like to go first? All right. Thank you, Andy. Um, Yes, I'm once again. I'm Una Daly, the Community College Outreach Director at the Open Courseware Consortium, and um, accessibility of open educational resources has been um, an issue that we've been very concerned about uh, from the very beginning. Um, particularly, I work with community colleges in the United States, and we do have a large uh, percentage, relatively speaking, of students who. Um, who um, claim a disability, and so it's it's a very important part of our work is to uh, make our educational resources available to all students, regardless of disability. And over the last year, I've had the pleasure of working with Open University on some of the OER research they've been doing, and uh, working with Chets and others on accessibility issues. And I'm just uh, thrilled to be here today with uh, these experts. So thank you. Thank you, Una. Uh, Chet, can I just ask you to introduce yourself briefly? Thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chet Colwell from the Open University, and um, I'm a manager in accessibility. Uh, my main role is to support um, web developers and software developers in making our websites and software accessible, so I conduct a lot of accessibility testing. But more recently, we've also been working with our uh, people developing our curriculum to ensure that that is um, as inclusive as possible to diverse learners. And I'll tell you more, a bit more about what we're doing uh, when I come to my presentation in a little while. Thanks, Andy. OK, thank you, Chet. And last but not least, Matilde. Hello. 
So um, good, um, good afternoon or good morning or good evening everybody, I'm not sure. I am Matilde Gallardo, I'm a, a senior lecturer in um, the Department of Languages in the Faculty of Education and Language Studies at the Open University. Uh, my background is in linguistics, but part of my role, as part of my role as a senior lecturer in um, the Department of uh, Languages, I'm also a staff tutor. This is basically uh, a role that uh, involves um, staff development, uh, providing staff development uh, and training for our uh, groups of associate lecturers across the languages. Uh, Basically, um, my involvement with the Open Educational Resource Movement uh, is in relation to this role as academic developer. Over the years, I've been um, um, developing or running even a number of uh, projects, scholarship projects involving associate lectures, uh, our associate lectures in languages, who have a special interest in developing themselves professionally um, in terms of uh, collaboration and re reflection and action research. So it's in this line that uh, we have um, developed uh, a number of projects, including the latest one on dyslexia and model languages, which is the one I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the impact on our student um, uh, progression uh, is, is, is obviously one of our main interests, uh, as well as the uh, development, the professional development of uh, language uh, teachers in higher education. Okay, thank you very much, Mathilde. Uh, with no further ado, we'll get into the presentation. So I'll ask Una if you'd like to start yours and take over. All right, thank you, Andy. All right, so. I just want to give a general overview of um, open education and accessibility needs. Um, um, particularly, uh, we are doing this during Open Education Week, um, which is an outreach event uh, put on by the Open Courseware Consortium. And we're trying to reach audiences all over, not only people who are involved professionally in education who may be very familiar with the um, information I'm going to present, but also to people who are new to the concept of open education. So um, thank you for your uh, patience as, as I go through a few preliminary um, definitions. Open educational resources um, have been defined by UNESCO and a number of foundations who have been active in OER as teaching, learning, or research materials that are in the public domain or released with an intellectual property license that allows their free use, adaption, and distribution. And so an open license um, allows um, reuse and revision of materials. Um, it, the author, the original author, retains their full copyright, but they make available a version under a Creative Commons license. And why this is so powerful for um, accessibility reasons is that this allows um, adopters and users of open educational resources to adapt materials as needed, uh, such as uh, with videos that are openly licensed, one can add video captions um, because, the, because of the license that allows you to revise the, the materials. Examples of, of open educational materials really run the gamut. Um, I, you know, it's open textbooks are a big um, item here with community colleges um, because they're so expensive for our students. But there's full open courses online, um, the um, open learn space at Open University provides those open courseware consortium, and then there's many videos that are online that are open as well. But this really can be any tools or materials that allow access to knowledge uh, freely. Now the characteristics of OER, um, once again, um, lend themselves to accessibility. Um, they start out digital. With which makes them easy to customize if needed um, for uh, learners who have special needs. Um, and the low cost uh, really lowers the barriers, um, not only for students from an affordability point of view, but also for students who may have special needs, um, a diverse learning styles. Um, but what we find is that um, a digital resource with an open license doesn't guarantee accessibility. And so that is uh, 
a large part of the message today is that we really need to be cognizant of what it takes to make our open educational resources accessible so that we're truly expanding access uh, for all learners. There is a great need for accessibility. Um, sometimes when I do faculty development workshops, uh, teachers will ask me, um, do I need to make my materials accessible if I don't have students in my class who um, need, need those um, accommodations? And um, of course, so we, in the United States, we do have a law that says your materials must be accessible regardless of the students that are in your class because maybe next semester you will have students who need those accommodations. Worldwide, um, approximately a billion people have reported a form of disability. And it has a disproportionate effect on their health, education, and employment. Um, and, and much higher poverty levels uh, for um, people who report a form of disability. In the United States alone, 11% uh, of, of students who um, are in the post-secondary education system report a disability, and many um, experience accessibility barriers. So we know this is an area that we need to work on and do better. There's uh, many treaties and laws uh, over the last 30 years that have come into place to uh, support this. Uh, probably the most um, global one that, that um, covers um, worldwide is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This was adopted in 2006 and has been ratified by 141 countries to date. So it is a widely embraced concept. Um, but sometimes um, the, the widely embraced, it starts there and then individual uh, countries and um, states and educational systems have to work on the details. The United Kingdom has their Equality Act, which was passed in 2010. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act in the United States was passed in 1990. And so in the last uh, 24 years has had a huge effect actually on um, our educational government systems, um, et cetera. And the Canadian Human Rights Act, which is the first one I'm aware of, was actually passed in 1985. And I'm, I'm sorry I don't have other examples, but there are quite a few other countries that have passed individual um, laws around this as well. So when we talk about learner challenges, um, we're talking about cognitive learning disabilities. Um, and this is really a growing area as brain research over the last 20, 30 years has um, made us more cognizant of um, what, how the brain works and how it, it um, learns um, material. Um, so really a growing area. Um, sensory or motor impairments, I think we're all pretty familiar with what these are, um, vision and hearing, et cetera, um, or actual mobility um, issues. Uh, language deficits is, is also recognized as a, um, a diverse learner challenge. Uh, this may be um, students who come in uh, and they're learning, um, they're learning English or some other, whatever the language of their course is in a second language to them, and, and that obviously presents a lot of challenges. And then the, the fourth category is lack of engagement, and we know that uh, diverse learners, learners with disabilities often feel disengaged from um, educational materials that don't have accommodations for them, and so this is, this is a fourth category. Um, so at the OpenCourseWare, our accessibility goals are improving learning for all. Um, through both universal and inclusive design. We help uh, curriculum developers to understand how to design OER that's accessible. Um, we want to empower faculty um, to, and tutors at Open University who are adopting OER um, in, their, in their courses to be able to evaluate it um, and adapt it if need be to be accessible. And overall, we're trying to build a community of practice around this. And Merlot, um, the National Federation for the Blind, um, the Inclusive Design Center and Open University are, are part of building this community of practice. And we invite you as well. Um, once again, the design and guidelines that um, are kind of the um, canonical um, part of um, 
accessibility is universal design for learning, which provides multiple means um, of expression, representation, and engagement uh, for uh, learners so that it supports um, multiple learning styles and obviously uh, students with disabilities. The web content access guidelines, those come to us from the World Wide Web Consortium. And, um, the Community College Consortium for OER a number of years ago reviewed 100 open textbooks using the standards from the, the um, WCAG or the Web Content Access Guidelines, which is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. These reviews, if you're interested, are available at both collegeopentextbooks.org, uh, a project of the community colleges, and it's also available at Merlot, who is one of our partners. And finally, I wanted to let you know that um, we do have an online community at Merlot. It's called H. It's called <laughs> sorry. It's called the OER and Accessibility um, Community, and it's available there at the um, URL on the screen. And I'll just say it's oeraccess.merlot.org, and we welcome um, your participation in helping us to um, make open educational resources accessible. Thank you for listening this morning, and I'd like to turn it over now to. Chet Colwell. Uh, Professor Vogue just coming in and I'm just, uh, just checking if anybody's got any immediate questions of clarity from what you said, Una. Has anybody put anything in the text box, chat box? Was it all very clear what Una said? We can okay, save, we, it. We can save we can questions save to all the end, the end. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to chats then. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to just start with a bit of an introduction about the Open University. Um, we have uh, approximately 200,000 uh, students who are mainly studying at a distance, and approximately 20,000 of those have declared a disability. And the OU it has a wide range of uh, open activities and provides OER as part of its charter, which is to provide education to the public. Um, so at the end of these slides, there is a, a link to our page that lists all of our open activities. But to summarise a few, we have uh, websites such as OpenLearn, we have resources on iTunes for you, uh, we have the OER Research Hub that's organising this session, and um, various other resources. But the Open University has a long history of supporting disabled students and just recently we've had a programme of work to embed inclusion in the curriculum. And in brief, that has involved um, nominating a champion in each faculty to uh, be responsible for accessibility and promoting accessibility to their colleagues. But um, an area that I'm particularly interested in at the moment is whether uh, the OU should have an accessibility policy about OERs. Um, and we're kind of working towards that, but in doing so, we, it raised a lot of questions. And I don't really have the answers to these questions here, but I would very much hope that we can have a discussion about it. So a question I have genuinely been asked is whether accessibility support within OERs is required or just nice to have, and what, to what extent should uh, OERs conform to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that Una mentioned. Um, and a point that's been made to me on a couple of occasions is that the tension between uh, including accessibility features within an OER, so for example, writing a detailed description of an image or providing captions on a video um, is not necessarily uh, easy for, for, for an individual academic or author to, to do. And perhaps the requirement to do those things might stifle their openness and their innovation. So I think it's really important that we achieve some kind of balance between those things. So, when looking at these areas, um, we also need to consider the legal and the pedagogic context. And Yun has already mentioned the Equality Act, um, um, which came in in 2010, but it was, a, was a, the latest of a series of uh, legislation in this country. And really, basically, it's very similar to the legislation in other countries in saying that we need to avoid discrimination against disabled people by making, quote, reasonable adjustments. 
and I'm sure that you're all thinking, well, how do we define what is reasonable? Uh, there are no test cases as yet, so we haven't had any kind of legal definition of what is reasonable. There is some guidance in the Act um, to help us weigh up the costs and benefits. Um, for example, whether the material is a core service and whether it affects an individual's educational outcomes. But um, those are quite legalistic uh, terms and quite difficult for an individual to, to grapple with. And the other important point about the Act is that it covers both formal and informal teaching and learning, so it definitely covers the concept of OERs. So regardless of the legal concept, context, the Open University and probably other universities have a moral position to enable disabled people to participate in both formal and informal learning. Of course, you're probably many of you are aware that we still need to resolve some kind of technical access issues in certain subject areas. For example, um, access to symbolic notation in uh, science and technology, engineering and math, but also access to subjects like arts, where there may be a lot of visual material, and languages, where there might be a lot of audio material. But of course, these issues exist in formal teaching. But perhaps in the formal teaching, we have the resources to make uh, reasonable adjustments for those students that may be affected. But I think perhaps in the informal area with OERs, we don't necessarily have the resource available to make those adjustments. So one resource that I would highly recommend to you is the Flow Inclusive Learning Design Handbook. So this is a handbook that does focus on uh, specifically on making OERs accessible and it provides very useful techniques but uh, I do feel that um, it doesn't have guidance on how to prioritise those adjustments um, that are being recommended and um, it, it doesn't but perhaps it can't navigate all of the legal contexts uh, around the world. So um, moving on to the slightly more technical context uh, you have mentioned the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and these provide us with technical guidance. Um, and they do have priorities um, to indicate which areas are particularly important. But they're not developed for a learning um, context, and uh, they don't really address the legal context again in different countries. But on a slightly more positive note, um, it seems that in a technical context, some ordering tools are beginning to support accessibility. And uh, I'm grateful to Megan and Beckett for pointing out that OER Pub ordering tool um, does prompt uh, authors for descriptions of the images that they use. And it actually says that this description can be read aloud, making it possible for visually impaired learners to understand the content. Um, to, to me, that seems a very positive uh, move, and I kind of look forward to ordering tools, including more and more of those kind of prompts. So, in thinking about this presentation, I uh, I was thinking about what would what would happen in an ideal world. Um, so, authors would fully understand the needs of diverse learners and know how to address those needs and not feel stifled in their openness or their innovation. And institutions would have full policies to guide authors and to guide technical developers. And as I already mentioned, authoring tools would support uh, authors and prompt for accessibility features and also prompt for accessibility related metadata. And that would enable learners to be able to search for accessible OERs. Um, and then furthermore, delivery platforms will be fully accessible. So at the moment, so far, we've, I've just really been talking about the resources uh, created by authors, but um, of course the delivery platforms need to be accessible as well, and particularly uh, the platforms being developed to uh, deliver MOOCs or uh, massive online open courses. Um, and in reading around this, um, 
there were further recommendations made in Anna Grzynska's report and she says that uh, creators would be supported with policies and guidance and that they would also be offered strategies for simple fixes, so for example pointed towards the accessibility features within Word and within PowerPoint that would allow, allow them to add accessibility features within their material. And then also Anna recommends that OER projects would address accessibility at a project level as well as an individual uh, resource level. So um, in summary, um, my question is, if accessibility for diverse learners is required and not just to have, which uh, nice to have, which is I think it probably is, what steps are we taking and can we take towards that ideal world? And I just want to take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, Tony O'Shea Poon, our Head of Equality and Diversity, who helped me analyse the equality act for this and also to Megan Beckett for the screenshot. So thanks very much for listening and I look forward to uh, discussing some of these questions with you in a little while. Okay, thanks very much Chet, so it gives us uh, uh, certainly one question that people can start to begin to provide answers to if they want to in the, the chat room. Uh, but let's move on to our final presentation uh, for this webinar and that's uh, Mathilde. So Mathilde, if you'd like to uh, take over from now. Thank you, Andy. Um, okay, well, um, Chet has um, pointed out uh, a number of uh, very important uh, issues in relation to the current sort of debate uh, regarding open educational resources uh, within the Open University. Um, the focus, obviously, for the, the central um, um, projects on the central discussion is on students, students' progression, student uh, learning, student retention. But there is another aspect which um, is, is the one I'm going to, to deal with, uh, um, which is, uh, is about the training of tutors, uh, the training of uh, our associate lecturers. Let me um, move to the next um, slide. Um, we have a very diverse uh, um, population uh, of languages uh, tutors uh, who are part-time practitioners, they work in other institutions, they are scattered uh, all over the, the country because we work, uh, we are a national university and we work in different regions. Um, staff development uh, is at the core of the, the, the support um, that we provide uh, to our associate lecturers uh, because these people do not have the chance, unlike in any um, other conventional institutions, to see each other on a daily basis. Uh, some of them don't know each other, uh, but the, the continuous professional development is, is essential to ensure that uh, obviously our programs are, are delivered uh, consistently and also that our students are supported um, um, uh, substantially and consistently too. The reason why we set up a project on dyslexia and modern languages was because over the years um, um, our teachers, our tutors came to us uh, with a number of queries. Uh, they are obviously specialists in their subjects, uh, um, language, uh, Spanish, uh, French, German, Chinese, but they are not necessarily knowledgeable or experts in uh, inclusive teaching. In uh, uh, accessibility and so on. So, but we have a, a very diverse, diverse uh, range of students, uh, and uh, over the years, tutors uh, have come to us uh, for support um, with questions about how can we support our students, how can we ensure that we are giving them the, the, the tutorial activities, for example, that we provide. The use of the online environment uh, for teaching and learning is, uh, is done in the best interest of these students and is actually supporting them in their learning goals. Um, at the same time, because they had to, uh, supported uh, language learners uh, for many years. Many of these students have developed uh, fantastic expertise, uh, very knowledgeable uh, resources, or very knowledgeable approaches to support individuals, but they don't have the chance to um, share or to disseminate this information to peers. So that's why we came up with the idea of um, doing a study development project. Um, initially for um, uh, well, 12 tutors, uh, in reality we had about uh, 16 because we had to, to extend the number of participants due to the increased interest. Um, 
to come together to talk to each other, to share good practice, um, but also to work collaboratively in the production of um, what we called, or they decided to call, dyslexia-friendly resources, uh, which would be on open access. In other words, something that other tutors, other teachers could be able to use uh, where they had the need. But in any case, also, the idea was to, to develop um, these uh, practitioners are more more confident in their practice and um, also, obviously, um, by extension, to support uh, their learners. We have to talk um, about uh, second language acquisition and uh, dyslexia if we want to understand uh, the context in which uh, we operate it. Uh, um, I have to say that uh, traditionally uh, dyslexic uh, students have not been encouraged uh, necessarily to take up the subject of languages. This goes back to the 1950s and 1960s which um, 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 basically uh, developed studies and research in language, in language acquisition, communicative language acquisition, and uh, it was perceived that uh, the range of uh, skills uh, required to language, uh, for language um, uh, learning, model language learning, would necessarily not be in the interest of, of uh, people with uh, specific learning differences and mainly dyslexia because of the conflicts perhaps in um, uh, language processing, uh, pronunciation interferences, and so on. Um, the reality is that in secondary education still perceived by many, many schools and by many teachers uh, that such as uh, like um, French, Spanish or, uh, or Italian, for example, modern European languages are not uh, suitable for people or for students who have um, this sort of degree of difficulties or different ways of learning. Therefore, um, what we had is, is a number of uh, um, adult learners who come to higher education with very little confidence in the possibility or in the chances of learning a foreign language and sometimes uh, even confidence in themselves as learners overall. At the same time, more recent uh, research uh, and certainly the recommendations um, in the Common European Framework for Languages, which is the sort of platform that we follow in Europe to support or to, to assess uh, languages in terms of skills. Uh, is, is recommended uh, quite the opposite. Basically, what the, the Common European Framework recommends is that uh, languages have a huge range of transferable skills which are potentially very suitable for every learner and uh, beneficial too because it gives uh, the person more uh, chances to social mobility, uh, employability, but also in terms of study skills, developing study skills um, suitable for many other subjects like uh, presentation skills, listening skills and so on. So this combination of, uh, of sort of more traditional approach to language learning and dyslexic uh, learners and more current uh, developers and developments has been very interesting focus of debate uh, certainly for, um, for our language uh, practitioners. As I said, we get uh, a range of um, other learners uh, coming to, to study languages at the, old, uh, at the Open University. Some of them have been supported very well at secondary school uh, and uh, they are very confident. They know the strategies they have, they can put in place, so they don't really require much support. But at the same time, we have uh, some others who have been um, identified or have been assessed as dyslexic, but not necessarily supported uh, um, very well because of a number of uh, reasons. These people have um, struggled through the academic system, but they have lost a lot of uh, confidence in, in themselves as uh, learners. They come to us, they disclose their um, difference, uh, difficulties, they ask for support, uh, but sometimes they are not sure exactly how um, it might work. Obviously, as soon as they disclose, the university puts into uh, practice or into action a range of uh, um, tools, a range of uh, uh, strategies to support uh, the, these, uh, these, uh, these students. But when it comes to the actual teachers, uh, they are not uh, provided with the same range of, uh, of support tools. There is a great deal of information available to our students in the university portals, in the websites, 
these are they are genetic resources they are genetic uh, um, strategies and guidance uh, but not necessarily uh, focused on specific subjects what we wanted was to do analysis of our needs uh, so we explored we did a survey with our tutors to, to actually explore what areas they found um, difficult but at the same time through them what areas they identified that their students uh, um, had difficulties with and a whole range of scenarios came up but the gaps that we definitely um, thought uh, that we could address with this project was uh, a lack of subject uh, specific resources for teachers for language teachers um, need for greater awareness of the challenges uh, faced by dyslexic language learners not everybody not all our teachers and not all our practitioners were aware about the issues of dyslexia about uh, what actually means or it might mean for, for learners and finally use all the, the expertise all the, the knowledge that uh, the project might have generated uh, to collate or to, to um, create a reference uh, 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 document some guidelines for um, teachers but also for course writers and for advisors we could only do that um, online uh, and um, through the different tools uh, that a workspace a Moodle portal um, workspace could offer this is the very environment our tutors and our students are used to because we operate uh, on a blended uh, mode of tuition so our tutors and students get together on a number of platforms and a number of um, um, tools like forums uh, illuminate uh, uh, platforms and now blackboard wikis and repositories to communicate uh, to uh, create active learning in many ways and to, to also uh, exchange uh, information resources and uh, assignments in many cases uh, so these were the tools that we created uh, which enabled tutors um, in dispersed locations uh, to communicate to get together and to produce uh, um, to use reuse remix and produce uh, different, uh, a different range of resources available for the OU um, language community overall We were very lucky to, to have um, in the project team members of the uh, university accessibility and uh, disability teams. They were crucial. They were crucial in, uh, in supporting the tutors in um, coming to our meetings and uh, explaining um, or, or answering queries, uh, clarifying issues. Uh, for example, this was a, a, a point and this was part of a presentation by a member of the accessibility team in which uh, labels and definitions around um, dyslexia, dysphasia, uh, autistic spectrum disorder, attention deficit disorder and dyspraxia were actually clarified and tutors were very, very interested um, because they had, uh, many of them had misconceptions, they, many of them had um, taught dyslexic learners in the past but they were not really fully aware about uh, the implications of um, this uh, specific learning difference and um, the, the idea that all these um, definitions all these uh, um, concepts could come very easily under the same umbrella because it's very often the case that uh, um, two or, or, th or even more of these uh, um, these concepts uh, or these uh, situations are easily identifiable in one individual. The aspect of collaboration was crucial to developing uh, knowledge, expertise, but actually to produce the intended outcomes in the project. Uh, um, collaboration was effectively online collaboration. Our teachers, I have to say, are very much used to work together precisely because of um, this is the only way of uh, um, progressing uh, or, or profession for professional development uh, in um, distance learning context uh, but uh, the collaboration in this project um, brought up very interesting aspects to which um, we, we discussed with the, um, with the participants uh, at a later stage for example the roles and responsibilities uh, we uh, were moderators the project team uh, including myself uh, were only moderators of uh, the, the, the participation but the, the, the tutors involved they decided um, the, the roles the responsibilities that they were going to take on within uh, their groups the way they wanted to communicate uh, within the, the tools that we set up for them 
um, also the timing for the different uh, sessions and uh, the work that they wanted to put forward. They told us very clearly they wanted to produce uh, um, teaching resources. They told us very clearly that they wanted to, to expand their knowledge about um, uh, what studies or what uh, sort of research has been done in the, the field of dyslexia and language learning. Um, and obviously to work together. Work together, obviously, working together obviously brought uh, a, a range of uh, um, uh, interesting aspects. Uh, for example, the differences between individuals, the expectations, which are not necessarily the same. The amount of time that each one of them was able to put into the project uh, and the subject of the, um, the knowledge of the subject matter in terms of uh, dyslexia. We had uh, people with a great deal of expertise because they had uh, taught uh, um, dyslexic learners in the past and we had some um, people who were less expert uh, level of engagement not everybody could um, uh, or wanted to engage in the same way uh, so negotiation um, critical constructive critical um, uh, feedback peer reviewing and uh, sharing um, um, objectives were uh, central to this uh, to the achievement of the goals. This is an example that uh, these are screenshots uh, examples of what um, some of the meetings on Illuminate uh, look like. The meetings on Illuminate or the presentations in Illuminate uh, gave uh, some of the tutors the possibility not to uh, only get peer uh, feedback from their colleagues but also to present what they thought uh, it would be um, a suitable resource perhaps to, to use uh, on the, in the online environment or in face-to-face -face tutorials with their dyslexic learners. As you can see by the, um, the screenshots, the participation was excellent, but not only that, but the actual feedback on the chat room was also very, very intensive. Uh, so this was, uh, this, was, this was great because uh, they were producing resources, but they were also getting a lot of feedback from their peers which they took on board and then they later applied or applied to the um, um, final the final version of their uh, dyslexia uh, friendly uh, tutorial activities the meetings the illuminate meetings also serve the purpose uh, to gain ad hoc feedback from the participants as a project team we wanted to know if we uh, what we had set up if what we had um, we were putting into action was actually working or not um, this is a, a screenshot of the final meeting feedback in which you can see some of the comments um, by some of the participants. They learned about dyslexia and they gained expertise and confidence. It was satisfying to give a talk. For many tutors, this was a brilliant opportunity to actually present in public some of the resources that they had um, um, used and uh, or they had uh, adapted from other resources. Great collaboration. Collaboration was uh, one of the, the key aspects. Um, they explored new aspects of being a tutor. Um, some of them had concerns about uh, being now um, put on the spot as specialists. Uh, but self-reflection and learning were also key aspects. And uh, finally, the, the, this sentence, a good practice for dyslexia students, good practice for, good practice for all, this came as a, as a brilliant uh, conclusion for the, um, for the project because it emerged that uh, many of the strategies that um, you can apply for, um, to support um, uh, students with dyslexia are really common sense in many ways and um, basically are useful, are beneficial for any learner uh, whatsoever. We encourage uh, participants to upload their um, teaching and learning activities into the Languages Open uh, Resources Online Repository, LORO, uh, which has been in place, has been uh, uh, existing for the last uh, five years. And uh, it's very popular with our tutors. This is not only open to the uh, languages uh, community of in the Open University, but um, to the wider world. So basically, anybody can access this research, uh, sorry, this uh, resource. Uh, and all this repository and all the resources are uh, included in it. If you look for dyslexia um, friendly tag in the repository, you will come across all the activities produced by the tutors. At the moment, they are uh, about 18 activities, but it's ongoing because, uh, as I said, this is open and people still feel confident and free to upload even more resources or to reuse and readapt existing resources. 
this is a very brief example of what one of these activities looks like. And basically, uh, what I wanted to highlight is some of the strategies that um, came up as, as uh, an outcome of the discussion. This is uh, about uh, what is a Spanish um, activity for beginners. And uh, many of the tips that uh, tutors exchange uh, have been put into practice. For example, the, 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 um, the background, uh, which is not bright, uh, the clearly structured uh, sentencing, and also the repetition, the constant repetition, but also including as much as possible visual and audio um, uh, resources. And in this case, uh, the two slides obviously complement um, the writing and the pictures quite satisfactorily. This is another example which highlights the, the pronunciation of the um, sound eight, eight uh, and illustrates it uh, through a number of uh, signs. Finally, um, the collection of, uh, we can say it's a collection, but it's, it's really a document which is used uh, now quite widely within the department uh, and also um, externally. A collection of our strategies, collection of suggestions, not just in terms of language teaching, but in terms of support for dyslexic uh, learners at uh, institutional level, but also in terms of tutorial preparation, tutorial delivery, assessment, uh, formative feedback, and all that. Uh, all the uh, suggestions, all the recommendations came together, have been put together in this uh, guide to good practice, which is available, is an open uh, resource, available, again, in the Laurel repository. And uh, this is basically the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm aware of the timing, uh, but I will be very happy to answer any questions uh, if you have any for me. Thank you. That's very good timing, Matilde. Right on time. Um, just move on to the next slide and say that here are a, a lot of details that, and things that have already been mentioned and others in terms of links that uh, people might want to follow through uh, later on. Um, but we now. Uh, coming to our last 15 minutes and it really is time for any uh, questions or comments you might have for panelists. Um, I'd say it's much easier if you can put any of those comments into the uh, uh, chat box and then we'll get the, the uh, various presenters to uh, answer as necessary. So has anybody got any burning questions they'd like to ask? It's all gone very quiet. Is anybody typing? OK. Thank you, Caddy. Here's, here's the first one. Are there any principles of universal design that do not support students with disabilities? Una, checks. which one of you would like to pick that up? Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to, to say a few comments and turn it over to Chet. Uh, universal design, um, this, that, this, let's see, that was the question from Kadi. Um, universal design is, um, is the approach to designing um, in learning, universal design for learning, it's the approach to designing wants to accommodate all learners. So conceptually, uh, that, that means that you would be um, supporting all learners. Um, it, universal design also works with inclusive design, um, which ha takes a slightly different approach, where they look at the learner themselves, their profile, and they provide that learner with their, with their individual needs. So those together um, are a very powerful um, kind of overarching concept. Chess, would you like to respond? Thanks, Leah. I think the only thing I would add from uh, our perspective is that we find in our um, development of curriculum that we, we can't um, assume that one size fits all. So we, we can't necessarily develop one resource that's going to be fully accessible to all uh, diverse learners and that we're having to build in adjustments for people with particular disabilities. I mean, I'm thinking of, um, for example, conflicts between uh, the needs of uh, people with dyslexia who might 
need more visual material and less text and perhaps uh, visually impaired students who might need uh, more text and less visual material or at least descriptions of visual material. So I think we find that um, we need to build in uh, diversity and uh, one, yeah, as I say, one size doesn't fit all, unfortunately. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, Chets. Um, while we're waiting for other people to to pose questions, uh, just perhaps put put one to you, to, well, to, to, to all three of you, you in a way, in, in a sense, in terms of trying to deal with accessibility, is the is the best way to uh, approach it is is a bit like uh, Matilda and, and colleagues are doing of trying to get professional development and training for everybody involved so they become aware of it or is it perhaps better to have some specialists to help academics and others you know is, is one approach better than the other Sorry, uh, Andy, I couldn't hear very well the last part of your question. I don't know if you mind. Okay, this would be, well, I was just wondering whether it was a better approach to do as you've done, which is to try to, to train or, or professional development so everybody becomes aware of all the issues and how to deal with them, whether it might be better to have some specialists who can help support academics in, in terms of, of doing this type of accessibility work. Well, that, that was exactly one of the aims of the project. I haven't, obviously, <laughs> because of the limitations of time, I haven't been able to, to give all the details, and, uh, but I'm quite happy to, to, to give more information now. Um, yes, that, that was one of the, the, the main aims of the, the project, to actually create a, a team of uh, champions, uh, let's call them like that, uh, who could uh, support uh, other, uh, I mean, the other colleagues, other, other um, associate lectures, uh, uh, later on. And this is in fact what's happening. Um, not all the participants in the project uh, were uh, interested in, uh, in developing that sort of expertise uh, in terms of training other colleagues, but many of them were interested in that. And uh, we've had a number of um, um, start development uh, opportunities for other people who did not participate in the, in the project, uh, including um, members of other faculties uh, like health, health and social care, education and science. So now the idea is to, to develop, to further develop um, um, this into a sort of more established um, uh, pathway or strand within the associate lecture staff development group at the university. And in fact, there is a, there is a proposal which is being sent to the, the, the um, management team for that group to actually implement that and to, to create uh, a strand uh, which would um, basically deliver uh, training uh, as part of the program to all associate lectures at uh, yeah, I, I'd the like university to because the, the quintessential or the core issues that uh, were identified by tutors uh, uh, on the project and which are collected in this guide sorry, in this guide to practice, uh, really uh, are a reference for everybody. There is a, a very strong genetic base to many of the, the recommendations. Sorry, somebody else wanted to talk. Oh, thanks, Matilda. I, I just wanted to add that um, in general, our instructors in the community college um, are not aware of the accessibility issues, particularly in teaching online. And so we do find that this is an education effort and um, that expert staff within the college uh, will provide workshops and, and various uh, types of training to help faculty to understand uh, how they can make their courses accessible. So it really, I do think it does take some experts um, assisting the faculty um, because this is not the main job of faculty. Um, although they often in colleges in the U.S. develop their own curriculum, um, but they need assistance with um, how to make that accessible. Okay, thanks, Una. Chet, you put your hand up. Do you want to uh, say something as well? 
Yeah, thanks, Andy. I, I was just thinking about um, historically at the Open University, I think there was a bit of a tension between um, the people developing courses and uh, the people supporting disabled students. And that in the past, there was an attitude, or an attitude in some places, that um, as long as there was a disability office supporting disabled students, then it was in a way their responsibility to adjust for accessibility and it wasn't something that the faculties needed to consider. But I think we strongly resisted that more recently and we're encouraging the faculties to think about uh, the accessibility of their curriculum because they're the people who fully understand the, uh, the learning outcomes that they're trying to achieve. So if, it, if I give you a very small example that in the past if the disability office was trying to describe a figure or an image that had been used in a course, they didn't fully understand why that figure was being used and so couldn't necessarily properly describe it. Whereas if the people in the faculty properly understand why they're using that image, then they can write the, uh, uh, an appropriate description accordingly. So that's why we've kind of shifted recently to have the responsibility within the faculties. But to balance that, we have um, now nominated champions in every faculty who are learning about accessibility and they have a program of workshops and seminars to raise their awareness about accessibility. So the, in effect we're, we're developing the expertise within the faculty rather than outside of it. So I hope that's useful. It certainly is, is Chet's. Um, perhaps another, another thing, uh, a question, I have in particular, that's for you, Chet, but for the others as well, because you, you mentioned about the OER pub and the, the, the emergence of some authoring tools. Uh, do you think we we have the, the, the right authoring tools for to, to really sort of drive home the accessibility inclusiveness, or, or is are some of the authoring tools we've got just still uh, mostly useful for uh, as a standard work and not considering these accessibility issues? This is not necessarily my area of expertise. I mean, I was very pleased to find that OER Pub was um, promoting accessibility. And clearly, um, kind of light touch tools such as Word and PowerPoint, um, they have accessibility features built in. But I think, as with um, web accessibility more generally, the, the technical aspects of accessibility, so does the resource have headings and uh, do the um, pictures have descriptions and does the video have captions, they're kind of more technical elements, but then there's the core of the learning outcomes of the material that need to be considered um, and their accessibility and really only a human can make that judgment uh, whether the figure is appropriate to describe, whether the captions are appropriate. So I think it's a balance between the tools but also developing the expertise of the educators themselves. Okay, thanks very much Chet. Um, we've only got about uh, three minutes of our scheduled time uh, left. Uh, I noticed there's been one or two things come in about the um, uh, student voice. So I don't know whether Matilda and Uni want to talk about the student voice or something else, but do come back in. Yes, very quickly. Yes, uh, definitely. It's uh, it's a very very good point, and this is the next stage that we would like to. We want to take the uh, project forward uh, to actually do a uh, study with students uh, and, uh, but also include tutors. I have to say, I mean, it might not be very clear necessarily for everybody here today, but it, being a distance uh, learning education uh, institution, what basically it means by we mean by tutors or practitioners in this case, in terms of uh, um, associated lectures, are the people who deliver. The, the, the tuition and our course um, uh, authors are not necessarily associate lectures. So there is a, a sort of um, distinction here which is very, very important in the case of the Open University. 
because it's, uh, uh, the people who support and who teach the students are not included necessarily in the production uh, of or the design of courses. And this is a voice that we wanted to bring forward. This is a voice and the experience and the expertise that the project wanted to bring forward and, um, uh, and show to, to the module teams and the faculty. Chips or Uno chips first, I think. Oh, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> can't carry ahead, Uno. Oh, thank you. I had wanted to make one um, comment. Um, Maureen raised the um, the issue of funding for accessibility, and um, I think it's it's a really good one, <clears throat> and <clears throat> because I think on a larger scale, um, you know, some of our institutions. Um, although there's legal requirements for them to be accessible, it's not always understood at the at the higher levels of um, administration. There isn't a vision put forward around um, being truly accessible. And I think till we get there, it's it 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 may be more difficult to find funding and so forth. Because I think all of us who've been working in accessibility for a while know that it is far less expensive and um, better if we design our resources up front to be accessible than fixing them later. And it, it, it's actually less costly to do that. But it often takes a vision and a dedication from top level administrators to build that into all of our um, curriculum development. And that's all I had to say. OK, thanks, Una. Yeah. Well, well, it's it's. I make it now. It's 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 playing on our hour in terms of a, this webinar. So we're formally coming to a, an end. So unless anybody uh, on the panel has got a last point or, or comment they want to make, I uh, will bring this uh, webinar to a close. Thank you, Andy, for uh, moderating today. And I just wanted to mention that uh, we will be posting um, the um, archive on the Open Ed site. Uh, hopefully later this week. So thank you to all of our wonderful presenters and participants. Yes, thank you to you all. I hope you found it very useful. And there are plenty more sessions and webinars going on in Open Education Week and activities, so do get involved in all of them. Thanks, Andy. I just